happy to spend time today to chat with Basketball Hall of Famer and legend, Mr. Basketball himself, Brian Curl. Uh, how are you going, Brian? Yeah, good, thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me on here, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and hopefully we can uh, go down memory lane and uh, discuss a number of subjects, because, uh, you know, there's a fair bit to discuss. You obviously love basketball, that would be an understatement. You're still involved. Many people, I would think, no offence to your age, you've been involved five decades, which is a huge, huge, you know, contribution to the sport in Australia. Um, that, that amount of time, you'd have to love basketball because many people would have probably retired by now, mate. Yeah, well, I've been in it 52 years to be exact, and, um, and it's been 52 great years. I got out of it for a little while. I, I'd had enough that I had a break and then I missed it. I, did, I found I had nothing to do and I retired from the government where I worked and, uh, and I went overseas, but I got bored and came back here and now I'm doing three times, four times, probably 10 times more than I used to do. And uh, it's just a great pleasure and I'm enjoying what I'm doing and, uh, and I, I'm very passionate about what I'm doing in, in all the fields that I'm covering at the moment. Yeah, that, that's awesome and it, and it shows um, over the course of your career you know, you've achieved a lot, but that passion has always shown through. So let, let's just revisit some of those things, take you down memory lane a little bit. You're a, you're a youngster. What inspired you to get involved in the game of basketball? Where, where did that come up? Where did you discover it? Well, this, this is a, a story that, uh, that I often tell young kids. I didn't start playing basketball until I was nearly 21. Mm -hmm. Never saw a game of basketball, never saw a basketball, never saw a basketball court. And, uh, I used to play a lot of tennis, but a couple of mates and I, we went to the Woolongabba Police Boys Club and um, we, the, the officer on the counter kept annoying me every week and saying, or every night I went there, that, hey, Brian, you should be playing basketball. And I didn't even know what he was talking about. So anyway, there was a, a soccer team from Oxley, I can still remember that, that played basketball in the off season. And uh, I went out the back, it was a three-quarter court was uneven had rusty cyclone fence all around it and two dilapidated old backboards and a couple of 20 watt globes over and maybe in 40 watt but uh, anyway that's where it all started and uh, after that I dropped tennis the next week so that's how it all started and uh, played for that team we went through undefeated to the grand final and got beaten by Lang Park Police Boys Club so then I joined Lang Park and the great Vince Hickey was the one that come and approached me to play for him and uh, you know, I owe a lot to Vince Hickey as a mentor and as a friend uh, and as a confidant. Uh, he was just super for me, a great mate and uh, did a lot for me personally and did a lot for my basketball career. At some point in your basketball journey, you, you, you were a Queenslander, born Queensland bred. I think your father was a policeman as well, um, read somewhere. And, and then you decide you're going to head to Melbourne. What was the motivation to go to Melbourne? Was It was like the mecca of basketball, I guess, in that day. And how important was that to your evolution and development? Well, uh, you're going back a fair way, Craig. Um, <laughs> Sorry. You're lucky I, I don't have Alzheimer's, you know. Uh, but look, it, look, I 65, I started playing. I only played here for 18 months in Brisbane. And uh, there was a South... East Coast Australian competition, probably equivalent to a poor man's NBL, that Brisbane played in against Newcastle, Illawarra, a couple of Sydney teams, Melbourne teams. Um, and the St Kilda Club came to me, uh, they came up here to Brisbane and I had a really good game against them and they came to me after the game, oh, would you be interested in going to Melbourne? So uh, I said, well, I've never been out of the state. I hadn't been out of the state and I was 22 by then. So. Uh, I, I went to Melbourne um, and uh, went down there for a, for a couple of months to try it out because uh, I was engaged at the time and uh, and then went down there, I liked it so much, I came back, got married in, um, in June of that year and uh, June of 67 it was and went back to Melbourne and lived there, I told my wife's parents that I were going down there for two years and I stayed for 16 so I wasn't the favourite uh, son-in-law, put it that way. From there, you obviously played in a league down there, and then you found yourself representing Australia. World Championships in, I think it was 70, 74, and, and also at the Olympics, 72? Yeah, well, going down there, I went for St Kilda, and, and the, um, uh, the tall poppy syndrome comes in, and people from Brisbane saying, oh, he'll never make it. You'll be lucky if you play second division down there and what have you. You know, I went down there, played with St Kilda the first year in Division One, and we played against Melbourne Church, and they'd never uh, been in the top four. We played them in the grand final the first year I went down there. 
and uh, I think we played in the finals every year that I was involved with St Kilda. So yeah, in um, so that was 67, 68, and uh, two years later I'm playing for Australia. Uh, we went to uh, Doc Rasky was the coach, Lindsay Gaze was a player on that team, Ken Cole was a player, Johnny Gardner, uh, a lot of great players, Ray Tomlinson, people like that, and um, which was super, uh, absolutely super for me to to play for Australia after only been playing basketball for three and a half years virtually, that's what it was, three and a half, maybe four years. Um, and I just, that was it, you know, and we were married right down there and I was working from seven o'clock till five o'clock every day, but I still trained five days a week and then twice a day on Saturday and Sunday. So, you know, it, uh, can you imagine players doing that these days? No, they're too busy, I'm too busy. I've got the iPhone, I've got to do something there. But yeah, I, uh, and going to the World Championships was, you know, it was a disastrous tour and all that. But still, I, I was overseas, and uh, and then in '72, the Munich Olympics, uh, which Lindsay actually coached that team. So I, I've played against Lindsay, I've coached against Lindsay, I've been coached by Lindsay, and played with him. So you know, and I got a lot of respect for him. We were, you know, like Lindsay, I put him in the second row a couple of times playing against him, but. Yeah, you know, we were still friends off the court and Lindsay was always prepared to sit down and talk to me. As much as I loved to beat Melbourne Tigers or Melbourne Church, they were called in those days, we had a passion and it was great, a great uh, rivalry that we had. But, yeah, you know, and there's a lot of respect there as well. So, you know, a lot of players there. But then you know, in 74, went to Puerto Rico with Lindsay. I said I was finished, I'd had enough. But Lindsay talked me into going over there and, um, you know, I went to a couple of Oceania titles and, uh, and then, uh, I retired uh, from international basketball and St Kilda and um, that was it. And then we went on a tour overseas uh, when David Lindstrom was actually our player coach, one of the greatest players ever played out here to be honest with him, one of the great coaches. Um, still keep in touch with Dave and uh, he was from uh, Oregon way up, up past Seattle there and uh, you know, a great friend of mine and still is. And uh, we played games over there and David got a job back at his college at Puget Sound and the uh, club said to me, flying across the Pacific, oh, Curly, would you coach the team in St Kilda? And uh, this was um, 1978 and I'd never coached, never thought about coaching, never read a book about coaching, didn't have any philosophy. And because I love St Kilda that much, I said, yeah, OK, I'll give it a go. So gave it a go. and. The year David was there, we won the Australian Club Championship, we won the Victorian Championship, which was the titles to win in those days. And uh, there wasn't much I could better the team for. I was on a win of no, you know, we finished third or fourth or second or something. And if you don't win, I don't really remember, <laughs> to be honest <laughs> with you. Uh, so, and I just did it. And, uh, and you see, when I went down there, people said I wouldn't be able to play, I wouldn't make it. When I took up coaching, people said I'd never be able to coach. Do you find that that challenge is something that you take on board as a motivation to, not to prove to them, but just to say, well, they're not in control of that destiny? Well, you know, I tell young kids when I talk to them in schools or coaching clinics that I run and all that, that you can be what you want to be. The only person that can stop you being what you want to be is yourself. Don't listen to anybody. Um, you can listen to them, but don't take your notice of them. I say, don't be rude or anything like that. But, you know, I had a lot of people like that. Uh, and then when you start to get better and better and they, you're making teams, then, they, then the bandwagon starts to get a little bit crowded. But uh, yeah, I, it, it's, it, look, I don't take it as a personal vendetta, but I love to show people they're wrong. I love to prove people they're wrong. People said that I wouldn't be successful, you know, with the Brisbane Bullets when I came back here. And, you know, the things I did for Victorian basketball and marketing and promotions and media and things like that. Yeah, you know, I, I did all those things, Craig, because people said I wouldn't be able to do it. But I proved them wrong. I think I proved them wrong. Look, you, you said 16 years at St Kilda now. 79, National League kicks off. St Kilda's in there. You win a championship. <laughs> you won win the, two. Won the first two and should have won the last three in a row. The we third one, you were, went to the Club World Championships and decided not to contest the finals or something? I think well, you were I, I didn't decide. So it. That uh, was the club did. I, like, I would have loved to have won three in a row. And we were three games clear on the ladder. That was a question I was going to ask later. You know, is there any regrets? Obviously, that's something that you feel like was probably a decision at the time that you, those players work all season to win a championship. Yeah. And then admin, admin make a different decision. So that would be obviously one of those if we touch base on that. Yeah, a little later. There was one or two players, and yeah, I oh, look. 
And I said, okay, then if that's what you want to do. And the NBL, a disappointing thing, the NBL wouldn't change the final one week so we could have played in it. So there was a bit of short-sightedness there. The club deciding to go, you know, rob the chance of winning the first three championships would have been mm -hmm. sensational. But uh, we went over there and we finished fourth in the World and the World Club Championship in, um, in, uh, over in Brazil, uh, just up from Rio there, Sao Paulo. And uh, we beat uh, Tel Aviv that year, who'd won it the year before. So, yeah, we, we made a world statement. You're, you're still, the, I believe it's the, have the second most championships in the NBL. I think after Gorgian um, is a record, NBL, he's got the record, but you second, so it's still standing the test of time, but another one would have been nice. <laughs> another one would have been nice, you know, but the one thing I'm proud of is that I've won more championships than any other Australian coach. And I'm the only coach who has coached an All-Australian team in 1979 to the Winner Championship. That's right. And no Americans, no imports. So, you know, that's something that it'll never be equal. It, it won't won't be equal, but there'll be other coaches, like Trevor Geeson's getting up there now with a few championships. Um, you know, and uh, Andre Lamanis is up there as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud. And those two guys I've had something to do with. I coached Andre Lamanis from under 12s to uh, under 20s, and Trevor Gleeson was my assistant at the Bullets there at one time before I got sacked again. So, yeah, look, you know, I, I love seeing that happen and uh, young people that I've been involved. I'm not saying that I made them get there, but, but I was involved with them. And, and so, St Kilda, we move on. You get, a, you get the call up, come home to Queensland, come and coach the Bullets. What was your thoughts on that? Like when, when, the, first, when the, the first conversation came up about the potential for you coming to Brisbane, coaching the Bullets the mid 80s? Well, 83, you know, I had a, a disastrous season with the St Kilda. There's a lot of uh, backstabbing going on, a lot of undercurrents going on in the background, which I knew all about. I then got fired the first time as an NBL coach. Um, and uh, the interesting thing was there, I had three or four clubs that were chasing me, but yeah, my passion was always to come back home here in Brisbane. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wanted to, to be up here near Vince Hickey and, and the family and all that again. So that was a motivating thing. So I came up here and, uh, yeah, Brisbane Bullets signed me up, uh, told me in a hotel room. I, I think uh, I got less than $30,000 salary the first year. And they, you know, we didn't sign any agreement and everything. And I ran the Orkinflower Stadium. I did the draws. I cleaned the stadium if the cleaner didn't turn up and I refereed games at night if they didn't turn up. Uh, Brisbane Basketball didn't have any money because they didn't tell me that they were 30000 in the red when I took the job. And uh, the money was coming from Queensland Basketball and Brisbane had Queensland, so uh, Queensland Basketball stopped payment to, to <laughs> pay me money. And I was paying for maintenance around the courts and uh, a couple of other things and for, for three or four months I never got paid. But, I did it because I wanted to do it. And once more, I wanted to prove people wrong. That, that's me. And I remember sitting in the stand with the president um, when I first came up here and uh, in the grandstand at Orkinflower. And uh, he said, what are, you, what are you thinking about, Curly? And I said, well, I'm just thinking about, you know, I, I'll fill this side here. And he said, oh, well, you, you know, you'll be lucky if you fill that side of the stadium. I said, no, we'll fill this side here because up then they didn't have those offices up the top. Mm -hmm. I said, we'll put 500 seats on the other side and we'll fill that as well. And I, I know one night there we had uh, 1,500 people in mm -hmm. Orkinflower, which was uh, only legal to have 700 in there. We had uh, politicians and uh, we played Newcastle this night. I can still remember it. And we ran a feed off uh, Lindsay McNeil's Channel 7 camera on the court too, where the barbecue was woofing through the stadium and all that. And we were charging people, uh, I think it was $5 to, to watch the feed. And, uh, you know, and Polly's were sitting in the, in the stairwells and things like that and sponsors. Mm. And the first year, well, yeah, we, we actually only got about 13 or 14,000 in sponsorship mm. and our total player payment bill was 19,000 mm. that year. So that changed a bit, yeah, I can tell you. Right. But yeah, so that, that's where it all started. And I said, and we will fill this place. And we did the first so, year. So 84, the first season at the Bullets, or was it 85? And my first season was 84, where we were runners up to Canberra. Uh, we lost by two points down in Melbourne to mm -hmm. them in the grand final. You had a, a, a teammate in Ken Cole and a healthy rivalry with Ken in the 80s. I'm pretty sure he's 36's a, a yep. coach. Yep. And I think he The flashing he got shoes to... and the cowboy hat, yeah. <laughs> so, now, um, 
I saw you and Ken at the Blitz and to see you two together, I, I snapped a shot and flicked it through to you guys. And, and it looked like two mates that, that or, or brothers almost. And it was a, a moment I just had to capture, given that it might be not have been a scenario that would be caught again. How much does that mean for you, like reconnecting with people like Ken, where you've had rivalry, but you've got that mateship as well? Well, you know, Kenny is a unique person. Um, Kenny was before his time for Australian basketball. Kenny had a way of rubbing uh, her hierarchy up the wrong way. Mm -hmm. He said what he thought, he did what he thought. And you know, you got to admire a guy for that. You know, he wasn't a yes man. He taught me and he taught... When we went down there, we had a coach that was coaching us the first year. And he would always say to us, look, I don't expect you to beat Melbourne tonight. So if you say that to somebody, you're not going to beat him. Like if, if I say, look, you know, that bar's three foot high, but you won't be able to coach or ca or jump it, you won't jump it. But if you say, I can jump it. So anyway, um, uh, Kenny, uh, he taught us to win. The first time that he coached us in Swan Hill in a, 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 Queen, a, New Year's Eve, a New Year's Day tournament up there, which was really a big tournament, we beat them. And that's what Kenny was taught. He was a bit of a rah-rah coach, a bit of a Ron Barassi type coach, if people know him from Aussie Rules. But he, uh, his, we trained harder than we played. Training sessions were just brutal, brutal. And uh, we go into a game, and the game was a formality to us. And we believe what we're going to win. We were down third, 28 points at half time in the grand final there one year in the Victorian Champs and got up and won it. That's the sort of guy you believed you were going to win. Kenny, you know, like I said, we then he went to Adelaide and I coached against him in 85 where I won the championship. He beat me in 86. But now uh, we've caught up in the last five or six years. Kenny's been coaching my uh, vet, uh, master's team. Okay. And, uh, you know, he's out there, rah, 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 and hey, you've got to get out there in the fast break. Oh, Kenny, hey, mate, well, we're 65, <laughs> 70 years old now, mate. We can't be doing those things. You know, I said, Kenny, just cool down. with. That's the sort of fierce... Right, uh, fierce competitiveness that guy had and you you did you just you played for him and uh, but now like you know I'll ring Kenny up well I know I don't ring Kenny because he does all the talking and, and, I, and I let him call me because he can pay for the call then but you know he rang me up there one night when I was living in Thailand three o'clock in the morning and you know uh, he talked for over an hour and my wife said to me Are you talking and I said yeah she said but you're not saying it I said hey I'll explain it to you tomorrow but that was Kenny, you know, and he was passionate about the game and what, what the NBL should be doing and, you know, very supportive of what I do now. And, um, you know, I caught up with him at the Blitz this year, as you said. Meant a lot to me. My boys have met him and uh, Simon knows him, but my younger sons know him as well. And I said, hey, this guy did a lot for me in basketball and uh, you can learn a lot from him. You talk about the vision he had for the NBL. You shared a vision for the NBL. When you arrived at the Bullets, like you say, you, you wore a lot of cost yourself, and, but then you had a vision, a bigger vision for not only the Bullets, but, but you sort of led the league by example with the way you um, had the Bullets going from a situation where they weren't overly financial to a club that was not only winning championships, but a le legitimate example of how a club could be run. How, just talk us through, you know, the people that were involved in that, not necessarily names, but but how when you have a vision, how you get the right people around you to, to meet and, and attain those goals, whether it be players or an organisation. Well, I'm a firm believer that you, you've got to have the right people around you and positive people and believe in what you want, what you want to do. They have to come for the ride, on, the, on board and go for the ride with you. They, they, you don't want them running behind or beside or in front. Everyone's got to be together. But one of the first things I did when I come up here and I realised that it was an amateur basketball association, which you've got to remember, they played Sunday afternoon, they got 150, 200 people to a game and they paid $2 to get in. Um, now that wasn't going to work, all right? And uh, so I set about getting a good team together. Um, I was going to get rid of Ronnie Radliff, uh, and be honest with you, but. Then people said, a couple of people said to me, said, Curly, you know, keep Rat, you know, uh, he's a good uh, marketing uh, player, player you can really market. And, um, you know, you don't want to, like Ronnie had floppy socks and was always looked like, well, he looked like a rat. Mm -hmm. And he lived like a rat. But great guy, great basketball brain. So we kept Ronnie and then I got a phone call that Leroy, uh, his wife gave him an ultimatum. And uh, so I rang up and said, Lee, would you like to come and play for me? And he said, yeah, I'd love to because 
Brisbane or Philadelphia was the only places he was allowed to go. And um, I said, how much do you want? <clears throat> we agreed on the phone. No problems, Luke. No handshake on the phone. No contracts in those days. And uh, that's how it was with Leroy and I. So, and then Larry was here, of course. And, uh, you know, that first year we, I put a team together uh, that were a very close team. And, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of players that um, wanted to be there. And I started with 23 players in the squad, ended up with 13. I couldn't cut the 13th player because he's doing so well. You know, he didn't want to give up. And uh, so I, I, I didn't have the nerve to cut him. That, that's, so I gave loyalty back there, so yeah. And then, you know, we roll on from there. Organ flowers full and I said, Chandler came up. And the committee said, oh, you don't want to go there yet. Let's establish ourselves here. And, I said, hey, you know, we'll get four and a half, five thousand people there to a game, no problems, you know. In 85, we all know what happened. And then I said, hey, this is not big enough for us, we need to go to Boonville. Well, you can imagine what the committee said then. Um, and the great thing, Craig, was that I got a, a bunch of professional people around me, marketers, media people, lawyers, all the big wigs of companies and things like that. And uh, uh, got a lot of support from them, a lot of ideas from them. I always had to do the work, of course, but so, you know, we went out to Boondle and they said, oh, you know, they're panicking, they're worrying, how are you going to make it pay? I said, hey, it's like when I said to them, I, I didn't even ask the committee or the, uh, that, hey, I've signed Leroy Loggins. I didn't even tell them, I just did the deal. And they said, oh, how much is he going to cost us? I said, don't worry about it. I said, Leroy will draw people. Ronnie will draw people, he's at the game. And that's how I thought, so. Uh, and, you know, I chased all the sponsorship and uh, in 1985, I think we got the, first, the largest sponsorship in the NBL, which is about $180,000, $200,000, a major sponsor. And then later on from Foster's, we got a million dollars over three years. So that was the biggest sponsorship deal in those days. And then going back to 85, 87, which is 20 years ago, that was big money. So um, these days they're, they're probably looking at a lot more. So yeah, it just got bigger and bigger. And, uh, and then, um, you know, we were privately taken over, uh, which to this day, that's probably my other regret. I uh, would have loved to have kept it in, in the, the association, things like that. But anyway, that's happened and uh, we've moved on and that's it. We've had a scenario where the NBL itself went through a heyday. I remember 90, 91, I think you guys made finals against Perth and, and things like that. And, and there was standing room only. We're talking about a facility you talk about Boondle and not filling it, it was standing room only, 12,000 capacity at, in, that, in that era. And it wasn't just um, the Boondle Entertainment Centre, it was across the league. New South Wales um, or Sydney Kings were doing really well. There are other, always some regional teams would struggle, but some of the, the, the major capital cities were, were, were okay with it. And the promotion of basketball, it was it's hugely popular amongst young people. That vision was there in the in the 90s, 80s and 90s, but then it waned a little bit. What, what do you see as the changing factor there in regards to vision? Was it a management thing or do you think just the sport itself didn't get the backing that it needed or? Well, you know, uh, I just go back a bit to uh, when I came up here uh, and when the league was started, I, the strength of the NBL was the clubs themselves and we shared ideas. There was nothing hidden. You know, like if you come to me and says, Curly, how do you, where do you do, what are you doing with the media? How are you going out and promoting it in schools and that? We shared everything. There was no secrets because we all wanted the league to be successful. Um, and that's why we were successful and that's why it grew. It grew and grew. And uh, you got to remember up here in Brisbane that we were lucky too in those days. You didn't have the Lions or uh, Broncos and the Roar and the Firebirds and people like that. And I remember uh, one day Ron McAuliffe, the great Ron McAuliffe, I don't know if you remember him, but he ran rugby league. He was the doyen of rugby league. And you see, I, I had people that, uh, I had uh, unofficial mentors that didn't know that, and like Red Orback from the Celtics. I modeled a lot of things that what I did on what Orback did with the Celtics and things like that. But Ronnie McAuliffe, uh, he, you know, he uh, ran the uh, Queensland QRL and his idea of a, 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 the best committee and or the best board is a board of three. You don't tell one guy that there's a meeting on and you hope the other guy's sick, so he's the only one there turns up because you get decisions made. And that's why I was successful with the Bullets earlier because I, I made, my, my agreement was I choose everybody that I want working for me. People that I trust and people that want to be involved. So we all work together and um, 
you know, I was up three mornings a week going around to radio stations. Just, I just knocked on the door and went in and talked to all the leading radio stations. I, I got them all listening. inside. Yeah. I, I, was, I yeah. would have been like 11 or 12 listening to B, or it wasn't even B, I don't think it was B105, I think it was Stereo 10 then. Yeah, it was, well, yeah. Really yeah. AM on the dial. And there's 4BC, uh, you know, Wayne Roberts, people like that. Mm. But uh, Ronnie McCall have said to me, he rang me up one day and he says, Curly, you know, I'm worried about you and the fireballs or cannonballs or whatever. And I said, mate, we're the bullets. And he said, you know, like, you know, what are you doing? How, you know, you're taking the town over and everything. I said, Ronnie, I was going to ring you. I said, because look, I, I was going to see if I could use Lang Park and put a court in the middle. I said, I'll fill that. He said, yeah, you're so and so, you probably will too, you know. He was great respect for me. He spoke at one of our luncheons and he had the utmost respect for me. They, they, they cherish things that you think. That people like that, and he was great for sport here in, in Queensland for rugby league. We talk uh, or hear a lot of coaches talk about the need for mentors and finding mentors in other coaches and athletes within their sport. How so? That's obviously big for you. How do you um, feel that's still relevant to today's game? Oh, I think it's very relevant, and you know, I still have people like Lindsay Gaze. I talk to Lindsay Gaze, and. You know, I, uh, I go to all the clinics that come to town, all the American coaches and things like that. I go and watch as many clinics as I can, the Queensland State teams, what they're doing, uh, because I believe you never stop learning. If you think you know everything about coaching, you might as well lie down and die because you're kidding yourself. There's, I learn something different every day. I watch Mick Downer from the Brisbane Bullets coaching the uh, Pirates QBL team. I go to nearly all their sessions, mainly because my boys are there, but I just like to see what Mick's doing. I like the feel of it all, and uh, you know, I'm not interested in getting back into that area, but gee, I, I still love to be around it. So, uh, yeah, mentors are, you know, Ken Cole, David Lindstrom. I've had some great coaches uh, that I can go back to, and uh, you know, I love catching up with Lindsay Gaze and just talking about basketball. We're talking about the evolution of the coaching and what's happened. So, yeah, good fun, and uh, but. You know, I think uh, more young coaches these days, uh, they do all the courses and they do all these fancy things and, hey, I know everything. Uh, and, hey, they don't. You, it, you know, life's all about experiences and uh, you've got to experience as much as you can as a basketball coach. So, yeah, and I'm a mentor for Queensland coaches. Uh, work with uh, Tom Kyle there and anyone wants to talk to me, they're quite welcome to do that and I'll give them the time up for them. One of the things that you were renowned for was allowing people just to have their right, like, like you work together to come up with an idea, but then when it was decided this is what we're going to do, you pretty much let people run with, if they're employed to do a job, you'd allow them to do that job? Well, I want them to have ownership. Um, and look, I wasn't a control freak or micromanage people. Uh, I give them a job and uh, we'd always talk about things, what we want to do and uh, how we do it. And uh, you know, if I didn't agree with what they did, I'd, I'd let them know and we took it on board, but it, but it was a, it wasn't an aggressive thing or anything like that and and that's what I mean I had the right people that you know they knew what my vision was and they wanted to be part of it and uh, that's that's what was so super about all those guys and uh, you know we got TV deals for instance like Channel 7 paid us over a hundred thousand dollars for a TV deal I don't think they get that now um, you know so that was a great innovation we had Channel 7 and Channel 10 fighting over it who, to televise us um, that's how important we were and that's the impact we made on the town. So I, I remember the seven coverage it went and then going across the ten actually. Yeah. In my head now I can hear the ads. Unfortunately the ads still sit there, B and D roller doors is just yeah. you yeah. know, it was always you know, this is telecast brought to you by McDonald's and <laughs> things like that. It's yeah. just, I just remember the coverage and the coverage was actually quite good for the era too. Uh, in, the, in regards to sport, it was probably ahead of a lot of the coverage of the other sports, possibly because it's an indoor venue as opposed to an, a, a lot of the other sports are outdoors. I think so. And in, 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 in the early days there, Channel 7 did it. Dave Fordham was the anchor man and Dave Fordham was, you know, uh, you know, he's passed away now and he was a great friend of mine. And, you know, when I went to him to, to sell him my vision, he jumped on board straight away and, you know, getting, uh, you know, the media people uh, involved, like Peter Blucher, I went to the Gabba, sat in, in the old press box was there, no air con, or just a fan and I was sitting there and a test match was on and uh, I met all these journos and what have you and they said, oh, you talk to this guy over here, he'd probably be the best guy because, you know, I go over to him and I said, oh, Peter, I'm Brian Curl and I'm involved with basketball. And he said, oh, basketball, who, what's basketball? Who is interested in that? So I brought him along to the game. Peter Blucher ended up getting employed by me full time um, and has written uh, a lot of work and he's got the history of the Bullets, things like that. So, 
they're the, the things that I, I put together, but I had him and he, he had great ideas. So I, I don't know, I, I got this knack of getting great people around me. I, everyone credits me with it, but Craig, I had some super, super people and uh, I owe so much to them. And uh, I try to give them credit where it's due, but uh, but yeah. is that any different to an approach, like I had a player say to me, if you want to be a great coach, great coach great players, is that the same approach that as a coach and, and, a, and a mentor and a leader, that, that any leader would want good people around them, so whether it be players or, or organisational people, you're just, you're just playing that role that you actually are doing quite well. That, that you don't, like I, I would say back to that player who said, if you want to be a great coach, coach great players, I said to him, well, it's the coach who picks those players. Well, you know, the, it was three years that I thought we should have won championships and the reason we didn't win it because there was one or two players weren't on the same page. They were on their own tangent. I've, we I've didn't, experienced we lost. that as a coach, yeah, exactly. We lost. It's terrible. The years that we team. won, everyone was on the same page. We were in the same direction. We gave everything for each other. Um, and, and that's, like I said, that's the same with people having working for you. You want them to work for you, like Richard Branson says. You want them to want to work for you and be happy working for you, um, you know, which is a, a great saying of his. And uh, yeah, so look, uh, getting great players is, a, is an art. Um, you know, uh, Perth seem to have a very good knack of it and uh, they have a, a, a big well as well to, to pay them and things like that. Joey Wright's recruiting very well also. And you've got to admire what um, uh, Rob Beveridge does. You know, now Rob hasn't got the, uh, the budget what some of these other clubs, but look what he did. So he didn't have a, what you'd call a super, super individual team, but he had a damn great team, a win. Quietly, I was barracking for him last season. Yeah. So. You know, I got a lot, of, a lot of respect for Rob and I can ring him up at any time and talk to him about basketball and see how he's going, things like that. And when he comes up here, he'll always do a clinic for me yeah. and things like that. So yeah, uh, he, he's a great man, if, great man. If we look at the 90s, obviously the early 90s, a decision's made, Brian Curl's no longer the Bullets coach. When that decision came about, were you party to that decision? Did you feel that was a mutual decision or was that something that hit you hard, like to, to be told that you're no longer the Bullets coach or was it time? Well, it was 92, 92. 92 when I was sacked the second time. And uh, it was a bit of a shock to me. Like, I'd been there, uh, what, four, first four years we played in the grand final. Uh, the fifth year we finished just outside of it. And then uh, sixth and seventh year we're back in the finals and played in the final again in 1990. Not a bad record. Um, so that was disappointing. Took it in stride. The way it was done and everything is, well, I don't know if there is a right way or wrong way of getting fired, but uh, anyway, and as usual, you know, the club said they want to go in a different direction. How many times have you heard that? Um, so uh, anyway, that happened, and uh, so I got out of it for a couple of years, and then um, the Broncos, who owned the Bullets after that, because they were sold from the uh, original mob, and uh, they came back to me there in 1998 to do it again, and uh, anyway, you know, which we finished up in the finals the first year. Are you the only club um, coach to actually come back to coach a, a, a team in, um, in the NBL like I you coach I the am. Bullets I and then, then they've actually got you back? It's, it reminds me of Steve Jobs to be quite honest. <laughs> the guy who creates Apple, they sack him and then they realise things aren't going as well as we like. What do we do? We get the guy who started it or help create the, the, the whole... Um, well in 1988, I've got to be honest with you, I had a phone call from Wayne Bennett and uh, Wayne Bennett and myself and uh, uh, Johnny Conley, Mike Young, uh, Johnny Buchanan, a whole heap of coaches here in Queensland. We used to have a dinner once a month, just sit down and talk about coaching. Lee Matthews, we had all the great coaches and uh, there were some female coaches there. It was super, super night. It, and you learn more about coaching at that dinner than read all the textbooks you like. And uh, that was great. So Wayne said to me, he said, Curly, I, was, I had, a, had my own sports fan shop at, um, in the Myers Centre at that time. He said, you're wasting time what you're doing. You know you're a coach, you know what you can do. Uh, they need you back there, why don't you come back? So Wayne sat and had dinner with me. And I've just been talking to Wayne this morning actually and I can call him any time. I, I don't bother him because I know he's a busy man. 
uh, but I rang him this morning, it's just like we were talking yesterday, so he's going to help me out with uh, one of my projects that I'm doing, so, you know, that, that's the sort of things that, you know, I, I, and Brisbane's a small city, and, uh, you know, you, you try not to burn too many bridges, you're not going to please everybody, you're going to have some uh, hatred from some people, I don't like the word hatred, but people that don't think much of you and things like that, but I don't, I don't worry about what other people think of me. I worry about what I want to do, make sure my backyard's in place. The other people can do what they like. I, I do things uh, Brian Curl way and, and um, in the next month or two, if a few things come off that I hope they do and plan them to come off, you know, I hope to make a big impact on basketball once more. So, uh, you know, this will be totally different. It won't be coaching an NBL team and it won't be opening it. Because I can see the, you know, some of the greatest things I've done, uh, Craig, is getting Danny Morsu as a 16-year-old down to Melbourne. Lived with me for nine months, got him to two Olympics. He worked for me, lived with me. I got him into uh, uh, college down there and got him a degree, uh, which, you know, he, he only wanted to go there and play basketball. And Danny, and Danny's like a son to me, and uh, Danny's coming back to Brisbane and um, going to set up some uh, Indigenous uh, programs here which we're doing together so you know and then you know I, I found Nathan JY up in Bamagar on a I was on a deadly sports uh, trip with the government and saw him up there and I rang Danny in Cairns said Danny get this kid out of here he's too like he was big and size 47 shoes he's on the a river. beast he's a huge <laughs> man but a great man and uh, so Danny got him see I get pleasure out of those things that like I'm not saying I made them or anything like that but Danny I did guide Danny in a lot of ways and things like that, and he's been very grateful for what I've done for him. I'm going to take you back to the 2000s. You finished your stint, your second stint, your second chance, um, and then obviously the Bullets goes in under um, some different reins and also a new owner. And then you're here. I'm guessing you're in Thailand when you heard the Bullets were done. They lost their license. What was that feeling to hear that news that the club that you'd help be, you know, you're such a huge part of uh, close to three decades. How did that, what, would, what did that news do for you at that time? Well, I don't want to sound dramatic, but it's like getting your arm cut off or a leg cut off, something like that, because, you know, it, it's been a big part of my life and I take a lot of pride in, in what we did in those days, um, the, the championships we won, and to, to see the club just go boom, like that, um, it, it saddened me, it really did, and, uh, and that's one of the incentives that uh, got me back from Thailand. I told my wife I was bored over here, there's things to be done over there in the Indigenous communities and running an academy, and I'd like to get the bullets up and running and be part of it, you know. Um, the saddest thing is about, you know, I, I got sacked in 60, what was it, only in 83 in St Kilda, and then uh, two, uh, 2000. 2000 was the last time, uh, that was the third time, 2000, and then it was in 92. And after 2000, when I got sacked the third time, I said, hey, there's a message here, Curly. And, and when I've been sort of fired and sacked, I always, if you're gonna sack me as a coach, I wanted to go to the front office, but it's never been offered to me. And probably one of the things at the moment that with the bullets now come back, you know, I've offered my services there, but. You know, they want to go their own way, set up their own culture and things like that. But I'd love to be able to do more for them. Uh, the Bullets and I have come on board now. They're going to support my clinics that I do. Uh, and I will promote the Bullets everywhere I go because I can cover a lot more ground than what the Bullets can with, you know, their manpower. So, uh, which I'm really happy that we're going to be able to work together because I want to make sure that this is successful and it lasts for a long, long time. Um, and so that's another passion behind me. And, but I, I would love to get, I know I enjoyed doing the radio commentary of the Bullets games this year as well with the ABC. ABC. You, you know, I've tried everything. Yes. You know, I've done TV commentary, I've done that. I've done the marketing, the media. And the, I've never done a course in any of that, mate. Mm. Never did a course. I got my coaching certificate from Bill Palmer when he was director of coaching in Victoria in 79. I won the championships. He's come into my office on the Monday out. He said, oh, Curly, I better give you this now that you've won a championship. <laughs> it was my level O or one of company coaching. You know, I've never sat for any other coaching courses, honestly. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I, and I hadn't didn't do any marketing courses or anything like that. But it, people, I just went out. I can do those things. Yeah, you know? sure. Something I did want to talk to you about was how you've seen the sport evolve 
the evolution of the sport over, not just not just from a marketing point in the NBL, but um, particularly with players and, and the work ethic and, you know, you mentioned earlier competing with iPhones and things like that. So how's the sport, how have you seen the evolution of the sport and how do you think the players today and what they're faced with is different to what the players you've coached in different decades and even as you, you as a player when you were younger, how has thing, how have things changed? Well, I'll answer this in two parts, Craig. The, the first one, which I'd like to mention, I didn't answer your question before. You asked me about uh, what was the difference when basketball, you know, really rode that crest of the wave and then went down. Basketball changed when, like I said, the clubs themselves, we supported each other and the clubs were the strength. Then we started getting private ownership in. And we had private owners who, you know, they probably could run a milk bar on the corner street, but they couldn't run a basketball club. They weren't passionate about basketball. We had the passion in those early days. The new people, a lot of the owners that came in, I'm not saying 100% of them, but a majority of them didn't have the passion. It was none, a bottom line thing with them. They stopped getting out to the grassroots. And basketball needs to work the grassroots because you're competing against the, you know, AFL saw basketball as a great threat back in those uh, late 80s, early 90s. And they did a, they sat down and said, what's going on here? And now Aussie rules have just brushed basketball aside. They're not even a threat anymore. But basketball was a threat to Aussie rules. And that was a credit to the clubs. But then you had all these whiz bang private owners and CEOs and all that that thought they knew all about it. And they didn't, they didn't have a passion for it. They didn't. And, uh, and that was a disappointing. That's why you had it down. Now you've got guys like Larry Kesselman who's come into it. And look, without Larry Kesselman, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about the NBL today. And, uh, you know, I've had a couple of meetings with Larry and I admire his vision. Uh, you know, he's, he's got the finances to back it up, which is fantastic. But, you know, uh, I, I can see a big future for the NBL. But, you know, as long as they just still keep in mind the grassroots, they must keep in mind with that. Um, they've never asked me any of my thoughts or anything like that, but I'll give them that one anyway. But that's one of the biggest ones and uh, so that happened there so that's where the clubs I thought let down honestly with the players you know like and you know you, you say this if I said this to you and you're a player and I said I say this to my sons oh when I was your well I wasn't playing at their age I said but I trained seven days a week and worked eight and a half hours a day and I was lifting big truck tires and tractor tires and things like that I worked for a bow repair tire service and I said I still had time to train seven days a week and uh, in the holidays, I didn't go on holidays or up in those days down in Melbourne, they went up to Yarrawonga on the Murray River and water ski. I, I stayed home and trained and, uh, and then the violin comes out, you know. <laughs> but these days, you know, like I, I remember too in, in 70, um, we were going to have a tryouts for the Australian team on Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Melbourne. On Wednesday night, which is the Victorian League, I did my ankle, I only did two ankles in my, uh, two ankles we've only got two but I only did my ankle twice uh, playing basketball because I never jumped very high but one I stood in a pothole in an outdoor court but anyway I thought oh hell I'm, I don't want to miss this training session I went and saw the Olympic doctor Howard Toyne who stuck a dart in my, my ankle on the Thursday and I trained the three days I hurt like hell but I wasn't going to stop but I go to training sessions here and I, I look around there's more players sitting on the sideline with small ailments and you know I, I can't understand it, you know, and okay, we've got to look after our bodies and all that. Like in my days, we didn't stretch or anything like that, stretch up or down or whatever you want to do. We, we ran up and down the court three times and then started training. And in Melbourne, you can imagine how cold it was at seven or eight o'clock of a Sunday morning down there. So I think nowadays the players have got too much support. They got the gyms, they got the masseurs, they got the physios, they got personal training, they got all this stuff. But I think it's overdone. We used to tape our own ankles. We went to the Olympics, we taped our own ankles and things like that. Now they get it all done for them. So I think they're soft a bit. Yeah. I really do. And I don't mind telling them that. And uh, when I see them here and I watch the QBL boys train, I say, what's wrong with you tonight? You know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my son, I get up, really get up him a lot because I think, you know, he's soft as well. And that hurts me because I wasn't yeah. like that. Yeah. You know? Look, look, I, I came up through the nineties and I felt the same that, that like I was seven days a week, there wasn't a day I wasn't at basketball, like coaching and or training, and both often on the same night. So, so the work ethic I've seen, there's been a change from the 90s. Um, do, you, do you feel like 
today, in the, the noughties we call it, um, 2000s and things, that we've got a situation um, where they're competing also for time with all that electronic stuff. <laughs> the, the, you mentioned iPhones earlier. Well, yeah, honestly, you know, I know my sons do. And look, I, I, it's amazing. I sat down with my two sons two nights ago and had dinner with them actually. First time uh, we lived together and uh, Max, my oldest one, he gets his phone out. So I reached over and picked it up and put it down for him. I said, mate, it's the first time we've sat down like this. Let's talk. And as soon as I said that, my phone rang. <laughs> And they're looking at me, both of Max and Toby, and I said, uh, I turned it off. And they were waiting for me to, I said, boys, this is the first opportunity we've had. And it, it, it is so sad, you know, that I know they watch the NBA and they watch this and they watch that, and, but all the other stuff that they watch, they could be out here on the court. They could be out here. And, uh, you know, Steph Curry, he trains, what, three or four hours a day, even on game days. He finds time. Just imagine what his media commitments would be and his sponsorship commitments could be. But he doesn't let that interfere with, with his training. But now our guys these days, every little thing, they look for an excuse to get out of training. And I think the electronic age, we're not going to change it, Craig. It's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. It's going to get worse. What, what are, you've coached a lot of athletes. What are three key attributes of the best athletes you think you've coached? If you could think of three things that, that they did as athletes that sort of separated them from the pack. Well, attitude be the first one. Attitude and, uh, and team awareness, I think is very, very important. It's, uh, it's not about them. Uh, you know, I always wanted players that, that actually played for, not for me, but for the club. Not for the name on the back of the shirt, but the name on the front of the shirt. Uh, they're the kids that you want. But I think that as long as they're a good athlete and they've got that good uh, attitude, you can make good players out of them and you can make good team out of those sort of guys. And that's where I was so lucky with Larry and Ronnie and uh, Leroy and Ronnie, uh, uh, Ronnie Radliff, Sibley, uh, players like that. And I've had some great players come through. You know, I had, and you know, I was lucky back in, uh, in 80, uh, sorry, in 1980, with Rocky Smith, who you probably, I don't even know you've never heard of Rocky, the greatest player that's ever played in the NBL. Averaged 34 points in two seasons, 34.5 without the three point line. Left handed shooter, couldn't dunk the ball. He didn't, wasn't going on mad 47 dribbles before he take a shot. Rocky catch the ball and shoot it. You know, uh, he, he, we took him to Brazil in 19, um, 1981, and the Brazilians paid him a lot more money than we. We were paying him, we gave him a 1964 second-hand Valent and an old um, unit to stay in. I think he got paid $9,000 for the season. And uh, they offered him a lot more than that. I can never understand why, but anyway, you know, a 1964 Valent. You, how would you pass that up? But, you know, that, that's the sort of players that I've touched. I've had the greatest, you know, I really have had the greatest. And uh, I'll tell you, this is the sort of players. Leroy was the sort of player. You never said to Leroy, Leroy, you're ready to play. He says, I'm always ready, coach. You don't have to ask me that. Leroy come to training. He'd talk on this. Once he walked over that white line, that was like clocking on. When the training session was over, he clocked off. That was Leroy. But you're out there, you come to train, you train. Rocky Smith was the same. When he flew over to us uh, from Oregon, from he flew out of Los Angeles, Rocky got off the plane, he said, where's the practice court? And in those days, it was 20 odd hours to fly over here. Mm -hmm. Fair what? And he went down there and trained for two hours, all right? He'd be down there training every day. He, he, well, work was a four-letter word to him, but that, 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 basketball was his profession. They're the sort of kids I don't think we're getting today. And even though they were Americans, and there's some, Simon, my son, you know, he used to train an hour before training, an hour after training, and uh, things like that. So, you know, there's, there's, it's that work load capacity and things like that. They, they, time management, that's what, mm. it should be a subject in school, time management. The kids don't know how to manage their time. Look, thanks for your time, Brian. It's been absolutely well, we only brilliant. covered 15 years. <laughs> yeah, we've got the future to talk about. We'll, we'll do it again sometime, I'm sure. We'll talk about other programs and everything that you've got going. We'll touch base with you down the track. You, you're a Hall of Famer, mate. I don't know if they can open a brand new double Hall of Fame and put you in twice. But um, no, thanks for your time. I don't man. know what it means being a Hall of Fame. I've got the key to the city, the Brisbane. I, I can't find a lock <laughs> that it opens. So. Look, mate, look, I, look, I just want to be known as Brian Curl, to be honest with you. I'm, I, I'm no different than anybody else. I'm no better than anybody else. That's how I am, and uh, I'll always give my time a day to people. A lot of people think I'm aloof, but I'm not. 
I'm always there to help anybody um, in anything in life. Our mission is transition. Slam dunk! The big guys jump. Danger to the opposition. We're the champions from the sunshine state. We're the champions. You know we're down the battle and it's too late. Can't be covered. The bullets are running hard. Run for cover. Brisbane Bullets, the champions from the Sunshine State. Thanks for taking time to watch this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you smash that subscribe button and also hit the bell button to get notified when new interviews are uploaded. Once again, thanks for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again sometime. Catch you later.